Hello, my name is Chris Kurzik, and I'm the Principal Engineer at Athabasca Engineering Solutions, AES for short. And uh, what does AES do? Well, first of all, we provide third-party value evaluations. We provide training and certification. We provide equipment re-rating. Welcome to part two, episode two, the final half of this uh, video series of two. And last time we, we had discussed about the general organization procedure, the applicability and limits, discussed the technical requirements, uh, assessment techniques. We will begin our discussion with that. We're, we're actually, we'll, we'll discuss that in detail. The majority of the presentation will be on that. And then we will move on to Section 2.5, Remaining Life Assessment, 2.6, Remediation Methods, 2.7, In-Service Monitoring, and 2.8, we'll wrap it up with, with documentation. And once again, we have Sections 2A, or Annexes 2A to 2F, which are reference throughout this presentation and you'll, you'll see them again and again. That's why we began these presentations with part one and two. It made a lot of sense. So Annex 2A, let's ref review that one more time. It's the technical basis and validation. Of, it's the, it's the, the exact procedural methods calculations. 2B is the damage mechanisms more various precise details. Annex 2D, thickness map stress evaluations, 2D stress analysis overview, 2E, material properties, 2F, alter alternative methods for calculating remaining strength factors. Now you'll hear quite a lot. This is step four. This is the assessment techniques and criteria and it's found in section 2.4 of the 2016 standard. And of course, um, there's the famous three levels. So level one is an assessment procedures, uh, included in this level, they're intended to provide a conservative screening criterion uh, that can be utilized to, with a minimum amount of inspection component information. It's sort of just to give a feel for the condition of the unit. So a level one assessment may be performed and either by a plant inspection or uh, by engineering personnel. We, in the last video, uh, we said, you know, it's perfectly acceptable for a plant inspector to do that, um, provided that it's reviewed by a, pro a professional engineer. And it says that in part one. Now, Part two is a more detailed evaluation and it has to be done by qual qualified engineers according to the standard. The assessment procedures included on this level are intended to provide a more detailed evaluation that produces results that are more precise than level one, okay? Level three is the most detailed evaluation. So in this case, this may involve specialists who, who do a lot of like finite element analysis, for example, very intensive calculation. Of course, the cost goes up with each level of assessment. Um, and the procedures included in this are intended to provide the most detailed evaluation, um, you know, with get within this program. And um, basically that is, so, so the, the, there could be numerical techniques like FEA or experimental connect, uh, techniques uh, that can be employed uh, at this level. We have section 242, which is the acceptance criteria, and that has to do with allowable stresses, and it's found in Appendix 2C. And the allowable stress values are typically established as a fraction of the yield, the tensile stress, or the rupture stress at room temperature and service temperatures. And this is kind of a fraction that is associated with the design margin. The remaining strength factor is, is, is 
kind of in a structural evaluation. It uses linear analysis with, with stress classification allowable stress for acceptance, but it's an approximate value. And if you want a more exact value, then you have to use nonlinear methods. But I want to bring to mind an equation so you can sort of get in a feel for that. So basically, the remaining stress factor you can see is a ratio. And an LDC is the collapse load of a damaged component with flaws. And the bottom one is the undamaged component. So you can see that this will be a fraction if there's damage. And so this is used in different forms for tanks and pressure vessels. So, so of course, for pressure vessels, the maximum allowable working pressure is the fundamental way pressure vessels are designed. So you calculate that, and then this will reduce um, your maximum allowable stress. And there's a similar equation for tanks found in that section and so on. Now, I want to talk more about something called a failure assessment diagram. That's the other assessment technique that is used. And it basically breaks things into two types of, of um, criteria called an unstable uh, fracture, which really is over here on this diagram, and something called a, cl a plastic collapse. And this is quite interesting. I, I always found this, this diagram, you know, uh, pretty interesting. Of course, everything with inside this graph is an acceptable region. And the, everything's outside is an unacceptable region, as you can see there. And it can, and every, so this is a, this side over here is a complete collapse, which is the, you know, the, the, un, the load limit type condition. And then this is like, an unstable fracture, something very brittle. And most mechanisms occur somewhere in, in here and here. That's why they call it a mixed mode, brittle fracture and plastic collapse. And they have a number of complex uh, equations for doing that. So in, in an, um, an FFS analysis of crack flaws, the results from the stress analysis as shown here, and the stress intensification factors and the load limit solutions, which are down here, the material strength, the, the, the toughness, all are combined to calculate K, K at the end of the day, and L down here. And these two quantities represent coordinates on the two dimensional uh, FAD diagram to determine acceptability. If the ass assessment is below this, then you're, you have it, uh, the component is acceptable and you can continue with operation. Within step four is a set part three, and it's the data uncertainties. Now, I haven't really seen this done much in, in my travels in the oil industry, but I have seen this done used in the nuclear industry. And uh, in fact, my, one of my first job was to look at statistics. And so um, wh why would I wanna go through this extra step? Well, it's because um, there's some, there are some in instances where your results may result in too conservative of an answer. Okay, so, and th this is when you really want to sharpen your pencil. So there, so you and you want a high degree of accuracy. In such cases, like you know, your estimates may not be acceptable. So this is where you would go this extra mile. So there, there's a a, a method called sensitivity analysis, and when dis discussing with the local authority, like in, in, in the case of my jur the jurisdiction where I typically work from in Alberta, um, you need to talk, uh, it helps your discussion if you understand the sensitivities of the variables. So the purpose of this analysis is to determine if any change of the 
uh, if uh, any independent input variables has a strong influence. Okay, so if you have some variables that, uh, like pressure, for example, is a very sensitive, can be a very sensitive component, then uh, it's important to know which variables that are most important when doing your monitoring program or, or the discussions with the government so or the local authority. So the sensitivity analysis should consider the effects of different assumptions. Okay, so with regards to, say, loading conditions, material properties, flaw sizes, maybe your flaws are, are so small that uh, they have very little influences on the change. The con so basically what you're trying to obtain is a level of confidence is gained from this assessment. And to, you know, you want, so you can figure out where your small changes are that you don't have to worry about and where the real changes are. Okay, good. I'm gonna go on to the next one here, probabilistic analysis. So this is using a, a, some techniques like the Monte Carlo, uh, Carlo simulation and there there's a few other ones Weeble and things and basically it's an evaluation of the dependence on the safety margin uh, on the uncertainty of independent variables that can be evaluated for this analysis so um, Monte Carlo technique uh, is is looking at the prop more of a probability analysis of a failure if something happened and in some jurisdictions, they, they may require that. That's what uh, API 579 applies. Another one is called a, a partial safety factors. And uh, that one I haven't used, but the sensitivity probability I have. The partials at this point in time, uh, the partial safety factors are individual safety factors that are adopted to independent variables in a risk assessment procedure. So the partial factors are probabilistic and are calibrated to reflect the effect of each independent variable has on the probability of failure. So these safety factors, um, you know, it's like a weighted type of average from what I can understand. And it's are developed using probabilistic analysis to method, method. So it's quite sophisticated and requires some experience, um, you know, a mathematician, a statistic person and the, you can do an analysis based upon uh, those factors as well or consider them okay moving on to step five of step eight remaining life evaluation a life assessment so this is important in determining like we said earlier your your your, your time between inspections and an example uh, that they cited in 579 is a general uniform corrosion where the future corrosion allowance can be calculated and the remaining life of the of the of the future corrosion allowance can be divided and you can you can figure out by extrapolation um, how much more service life you have another example may be a long-term creep damage where for future damage rate can be estimated. And then you would again establish an appropriate inspection interview. Uh, you know, you can you can establish that with some math, determine the fraction of remaining life. And um, the estimate of remaining life should be conservative, right? So to make sure you're okay, because there's there's things there that we don't see, like material properties for example, can change like for, for um, you know, um, the grain structure can change and become more brittle, for example, in the case of high temperature steels. Uh, there's stress assumptions, um, you know, there's variability in for future damage rates that, that you can't see. And so um, some other thoughts here. Established, uh, established with a reasonable uh, certainty, we talked about that. And uh, there, you know, there needs to be a little or, or no remaining life um, can be a problem. So if there's little, little or no remaining life in the case of remediation, such as a repair or damage component, applicable, uh, the application is like a linear coding to isolate the environment. Then frequent monitoring may be necessary for future operation. So there's discussions about little or no remaining life, establishing a, a reasonable uh, criterion 
uh, gives advice for those type situations. Step six, remediation section 2.6, doesn't really have a lot there. All it does is it basically points to particular parts um, for specific information. For example, um, you know, for, for different things. And it also points to specific API specifications. The, the one that I'm most familiar with is API 653, the, the damage repairs for tanks. And um, and so on. So you, you have to review the particular flaw mechanism and the specific spec. That's where you would need to go. There's monitoring. In service monitoring, we found in two, section 27, points out to a few examples of what kind of monitoring that can be done. You can use you know, hydrogen probes, ultrasonic examination and contamination of the process for, for monitoring. And basically that's it for what it has to say about monitoring. Step, step eight, documentation. The, the most important statement that F, FS analysis says, reads in 279 is that the documentation it shall be sufficiently documented such that the analysis can be repeated later. So everything that's in that document must be reproducible. And in some jurisdictions, you must have sufficient information uh, for if there is ever issues with the court or defending because uh, professional engineering steps uh, can be required. The elements of the, the package, which is document 2.8 in more detail uh, includes applicability and limitations, data requirements, assessment techniques and acceptance criteria, remaining life assessment, remediation, monitoring, and, uh, and record retention. Now, we've already gone through steps one to eight, so basically we're incorporating all steps one to eight into the final package. I hope that you found this presentation useful and valuable to you. This was provided by Athabasca Engineering Solutions. We'd love to hear your feedback and, and your thoughts on further videos. And we'd love to hear from you. Maybe we can do some business. Please subscribe to our channel so you don't miss a thing. Take care for now.